All right. Excited to be here this morning. Excited to be back from vacation. <laughs> I need to be back just to, to recover from vacation. I don't know how you guys vacation, but when I vacation, I vacation harder than I normally live. And so I need to come back to work because work is normally easier than vacation. So on vacation, I got to have a lot of fun. My mic's off. You want me to turn my mic off? <laughs> Are you on my mic on now? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? You wish for sprint now. I know. Go figure. Go figure. You know? That's like becoming a Raiders player after you play for the Chargers. I mean, it just it doesn't work. So I'm going to tell you about my vacation in a minute, but I just remember there's something I want to talk about. My vacation. I had a great time. Had this really cool experience on the last day, the last day that we were there on the cruise ship, they had this, this huge show with all their performers and everything, and and they needed some people, some volunteer participation from the audience. So y'all know me. I'm raising my hand. They said they need someone to sing. I said, Oh, I'm in. But uh, and, and so I got to get up on stage and dance. Yes. <laughs> and, and so I got to get up on stage and dance, and my daughter, by the way, who was trying to raise money for college tuition, recorded it, and for $10, she will let you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was all over the table. She's waiting for Vincent to come back so she can get them up on the big screen. And Vincent said, you have to wait until I'm there, because there were other things. Funniest videos, huh? <laughs> yes, it is so, technology is so awesome. But anyhow, you know, it's such a cool experience. One of those things where, man, I can't wait to go and tell people about how cool that was. I said, has anyone ever had one of those kind of really cool experiences where they couldn't wait to tell someone about it? A couple of people. Great, leave your hand up. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 All right, Bonnie. This last weekend was out fishing in the road. Fishing? Catching fish? Absolutely. Thank you. But uh, it's like the main thing is that's like a clean two hundred. Oh, two hundred games. Oh, right. I, I pulled two hundred months, it just took me three games to get there. <laughs> A good looking man like you have to have a story, one of the things that you couldn't wait to tell everyone about. Uh, <laughs> the only thing that comes to the top of my head was that uh, the girls had a VBS down the block. And, um, but wait a minute, you're, you're going to come here and start talking about a VBS down the street at another church. <laughs> you, you couldn't say something like, you know, I have one of those experiences every morning when I get up and look in the mirror. <laughs> Anywho, <laughs> uh, I picked up the girls and uh, they shocked me because they recited Isaiah 9, 6 and uh, Alani has like, a chronic disorder and she like said every word uh, from top to bottom and uh, I was very proud of that. Uh, so what is that day and I said? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Joy, you got one? Did your hand just come up? I do, but I... <laughs> come on, Joy. I'll try not to make fun of you too much. <laughs> well, you know you get excited when you get engaged. Oh, so yeah. You're like, the whole world when you get engaged. Like, Absolutely. You know, when I got engaged, I was very excited. I didn't want to tell everybody. <laughs> How did Jeff take the news? You know, he was... <laughs> 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 Actually, you know, Almost everyone has a story, you know, they say you got like 15 seconds of fame and mine is way gone over 15 seconds. But you have those moments where you're like, man, I can't wait to tell everyone about what just happened to me. Because the hope is, is that everyone is going to now look at us differently. And, and those things become sources of pride in our life. 
And we're all looking for those moments. We're all looking and waiting for those moments where we get so excited we can't wait to tell everyone. But yet the Lord, the Lord says those are the things that we should fear in life. I mean, not necessarily getting engaged. <laughs> I've met some of the people that have come into my office. Some of those people should have feared getting engaged. one lady get mad at me because I refused to do her wedding and she told me like three years later she's like I'm still mad at you I was like why are you mad at me she's like because you refused to do my wedding and I was like oh I'm sorry how's it going she's like well we're divorced <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm still mad at you <laughs> <laughs> you have any of that? So, the Lord says we should fear those moments. Because those moments create great pride in our lives. I can talk about being able to be up on the stage dancing in front of everyone on the cruise ship. Man, that was all me. we walk through 2 Corinthians, and one of the things that Paul's been teaching us is about humility. He says it's joyful, he basically teaches this week, the joyful growing families, praise the Lord for a life that brings humility. We don't like those events of life that bring humility. They bring brokenness. And most of us run from those things as fast as we can. Most of us we can choose from being up on stage, dancing in front of people and having a good time to having our life stop. Every time we're going to choose the good stuff. we're going to boast about it and we're going to brag about it. Paul's got a completely different lesson to teach to us today. I want to encourage you to open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And there's a possibility that some of you are not going to like some of the things I have to say today. So, feel free, my email address and phone number are right there. Just let me know. I'll let you know why in a minute if you don't figure it out. Paul's teaching, though, about two events that happen in his life. One is an event that everyone else would boast about. And the other is something that no one would want to talk about. And Paul says, this one over here that I could boast about, I tried never to talk about. And this other thing, this other thing I prayed the Lord for. Paul says, I must go on boasting. It was kind of demanded by the Corinthians that he spent some time boasting. He says, although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And in case you don't understand, this man that he is talking about is himself. His brother was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know. Just reiterating the point, but God knows was caught up to paradise, which is heaven. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I could choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking, I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. Paul starts off this thing, he says, you know, I had this moment, 
where I got taken up to heaven. Now, how many people think that it would be really cool to be taken up to heaven? As long as it's not a one-way trip, right? Very much. I mean, but most of us are ready for when that day comes, and it's only a one-way trip. But, but to get the chance to go to heaven, how many of us would think, man, if I got a chance to go to heaven, the first thing I would do is come back and say, Pastor, I need to teach this week because I just went to heaven and I came back and I got something to tell people. And we, we didn't want to know it's got to be all about this, Paul said, you know, there's a couple things you need to understand. See, Paul said his vision did not bring you know. Being chosen by God to go to heaven does not bring humility to life. So Paul said, I'm not going to talk about it because it wasn't anything I did. God didn't say, hey, you know what? You have done X, Y, and Z, and you have accomplished all these things, and because of all the things that you've done, because of how great you are, I'm going to bring you up to heaven just because I'd like to spend a little bit. Some reason God was chosen and he got to go. But if you notice, he says, there is nothing to be gained. So I can talk about it, but there is nothing to be gained by my trip to heaven. I want you to wrap your wrap your minds around that truth for a minute. There is nothing to be gained by someone telling you about their trip to heaven. I'm sure many of you have heard of the book or seen the movie that heaven is for real. I spent several hours studying it and watching videos about this kid that went to heaven and listened to him talk and things like that. <coughs> Whether he went or not, I don't know. I have my reservations. I know this. The Word of God says that, there, that man is not permitted to tell what he has seen or heard. We get all excited and oh my goodness, this kid went to heaven and he got to see Jesus and and he got to go and, and meet the Father, and he got to do this, and he got to do this, and, and oh, it's so incredible, and we rush out, and we buy the book, and we read it, and, 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 and we try to learn as much as we can about heaven, but he didn't tell anything that we don't already know from this book. And his main message is, Jesus loves you very, very much, and he wants you to know it. He even wrote a song about it, or someone wrote it for him. And he performs it whenever he goes to speak. That's surprising because I had never read this book and discovered that Jesus loved me very, very much and he wanted me to know. I'm so glad he told me. And I don't mean to mock him. There's nothing he told anybody that added to what this book has already told us about the greatness of who God is about the greatness of what heaven is. But we rush out to buy the book because we would rather read the book than this book. We like his book because his book doesn't demand that we change how we live our lives. I think, I think I'll read that book because that book's safe. That book isn't living and active. That book that appears into my soul, separating the marrow from the bone because it is so powerful, changing how I live. So that book is safe, but this book. I start reading this book. This book makes a difference. I hear all the time people saying, oh, the book's boring. It's hard to read. This, this, this. I don't know. I 
que o Tom Miguel the only thing that makes it difficult is that it demands change in my life. And if I don't read it with the hope of change in how I live, then it's born. Because that is the whole purpose of this book. And so if I don't read it for its purpose, I'm not going to get anything out of it. Reading a cookbook can be either very exciting or very boring depending on what your purpose is. If I read a cookbook with no intention whatsoever of cooking, it is going to be very boring. But when I allow that cookbook to change how I do things, that book becomes very exciting. Paul says, there's nothing to be gained about it. And that's why I'm not committed to talk about it. There's no greatness about who God is that cannot and has not already been revealed through this book. Actually, if you look at the first four words of this book, they are mind-blowing. In the beginning, Wow. Wow. Like before the beginning. Wow. And really, once I begin to understand those four words and the greatness of God through those four words, Did it help you stop 
need for someone to forgive them? Did it help you get up every morning and spend more time reading this word? I think the Lord allowed Paul to see what he saw and to experience what he experienced in him. Because the Lord said, Paul, if you have a life ahead of you that's not going to be very fun. You have a life ahead of you that is going to be filled with beatings, imprisonment, and your life will be taken from you. And so Paul, I want you to experience this. I want you to see this and know this. So that when the day comes that you are experiencing these things, you can look back and remember Remember what heaven is like to endure the things that you will have to endure. But even that is not necessary, Paul says. Paul goes on. Because you see, instead of instead of being excited about the things that bring pride. Paul glorifies the Lord by sharing his frustration. That's why in verse 7 he starts with saying, To keep me from becoming conceited. Anyone else can help with that besides me? No, a couple of you. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelation. There has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Possibly a rage of Satan. <laughs> Three times I pleaded with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and in insults hardships and persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Anyone just love to be insulted? Paul says, I delight in it. So there was given to him a thorn in the flesh. And it doesn't say exactly what this thorn is. Only that it was there to torment him. I think the specifics are not included because the church in Corinth knew what it was. He gave us a little bit of, of, of information. He said that it was a messenger of Satan. The word messenger is the Greek word angelos. And if you didn't figure it out, it is the word that is used to describe the angels of the Lord because they were messengers. And so it was most likely one of the angels who had fallen and, and became part of Satan's army. And this thorn in his flesh, what it was, besides this messenger, is unclear. It was quite possibly these people that followed Paul around with a different message trying to convince Paul that things were what they were for, trying to convince the people that Paul taught, that Paul was worthless, that Paul was weak and shouldn't be listened to, that Paul wasn't a godly man. And it says three times he took it to the Lord. And I don't think this is just like three times Paul decided to pray in front of the Lord and say, Lord, would you take this away from me, please? I think this is three seasons in his life that he committed to pray for this thing. Because if I'm correct, and there was a messenger of Satan that empowered people and spoke through people to destroy his ministry, wherever Paul would go, these people would show up 
and began to destroy the work that he had started for the war. As a minister, I can't tell you how frustrating that would be. And it says three times Paul committed this thing to prayer. In brokenness, Paul sought the Lord out. And the Lord's response is that God's grace is sufficient for all that torments us. God's grace is sufficient for all that torments us. We don't grasp that truth. I'm quite certain I haven't grasped that until you get it. Also, I can have this experience over here that becomes a source of pride in my life. Or I can have this experience here that drives me to my knees in brokenness one makes life all about how great I am that I must have been chosen for this. One drives me deep into intimacy with God. Fair or not fair? What do you mean? 
Did I earn that? No, that's not fair. He just died for me for nothing. Besides his love. I earned that. In separation from God for all eternity. That's what fair is. If you want to start talking about fair, we can talk about fair. Life was, life was never promised to be fair, it was never promised to be easy. We like to forget that we are in a war, a spiritual war. Because when everything is going right and everything is good, I can walk in all my pride and talk about how great things are. And normally when I do, I point the finger at me when everything is great. Paul said I have a different plan for my life. I praise God for the things that bring to me. We experience them. And in those moments, sometimes you really begin to understand what God's grace is. And in grace is just the word that means love I didn't deserve. You see, it's only he's only great in my life when I need him to be great. No one prays for a miracle in their life when they don't have a need. Everything is wonderful and perfect. No one prays to see the greatness of who God is when everything is well. But man, you give us those days where the insults are flowing, where the messenger of Satan is tormenting. flesh is just screaming out for revenge. Some of those days we are driven closer to the Lord in our brokenness and in our despair than we could ever reach Him in everything we love. Sometimes we try to fix it on our own instead. I mean, if you know what I need, we need to buy something. Or maybe right now you just need a big old bowl of chocolate. Everyone likes chocolate when you get your And we try to do things on our own instead of just falling before the Lord. Paul was where he was at, not because he had done something wrong, but because he had served the Lord with all his heart, mind, and soul. And Satan wanted to stop the attack. My challenge is this. Do you believe that God's grace is sufficient? And I know it's easy to sit here and say yes. Another thing to do. Another official machine that helps us. And we pray to the Lord all the time, Lord, take these away. What if that's the Lord's answer? My grace is sufficient. The love I give you is enough. It's what you need to be about to feel. Some of us struggle financially. Some of us love us. What if the Lord says, you know, I'll provide you a little bit, but I want my love to you to be all you need every day to be part. And don't worry about the money.
would love for you to experience sufficiency of His grace. I would love to experience it. There is a depth to it that we cannot even begin to imagine. Maybe some of you here today have been in the call of that. And God said, my grace will be enough. And it lifted a burden off of your shoulders. And you experienced that grace. And if that's you, I would love to hear that story. I posted on Facebook basically this slide talking about today's message. I would love to hear how you experience God's grace in your conversion. Can you comment on it? So that we all can learn. Because until we understand the truth that His grace is sufficient for all, of our, all of the things that torment us, we will continue to run into the world try to find a different solution. And we will continue to struggle and stumble. And the things that torment us will continue to have victory over us. I suspect Paul is ready to leave the ministry because of this thing that torment us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you today, and there is no doubt that we are here broken and frustrated. Some in despair, some ready to throw their hands up and just walk away from everything, as if the Lord, as if the world has a better answer. Father, I pray today the sufficiency of your grace into our lives. Lord, I pray that we would learn to praise you for the moments that you bring to bring us to humility. Because it is only it is only then that we can truly experience the greatness of who you are. And we will fight. Lord, move us Right.